When you hear the word combustion, what does it make you think of? A campfire? Maybe a candlelit dinner? How about spontaneous combustion? For many people like myself, combustion means power. It's a source of power. And I don't mean the type of power sought by dictators or politicians. I mean horsepower, the rate of doing work, getting from point A to point B. Now, a popular way of getting from point A to point B is with your car, right? Most of the cars on the road today use combustion. Internal combustion in the engine that powers your car. Now, internal combustion has been around for a long time, since about the 1790s. Nicholas Otto and others developed the basis of the internal combustion in the 1860s and 1870s, so about 150 years ago. Now, internal combustion has come a long way since then. Not only does it have the potential to go further, I would argue that it needs to go further and that we should want it to go further. Now, whether we like it or not, internal combustion will be in our lives for the next 30 to 40 years. It just will be. So here's an idea. Why don't we keep improving it? One of the most immediate ways that we can go green is by advancing the internal combustion engine. Now, I know the idea of going green with internal combustion probably sounds outrageous to many of you, and I get that. Recent events like the Dieselgate scandal don't help this mindset at all. Pop culture and the media have many of us believing we're already on the cusp of a post-fossil fuel society. But it's actually much further away than you might think. Check this out. In 2008, when a gallon of gasoline was about $4, President Obama set a goal of putting one million electric vehicles on the road by the end of 2015. But actually, only about 400,000 electric vehicles were sold in that time frame. Why not more? Why weren't consumers flocking to electric vehicles? Well, the answer is actually pretty straightforward. Fuel prices came way down. Electric vehicles tend to cost more. They have a limited range and there's usually a limited availability of charging stations. In fact, the Department of Energy projects that in 2040, about 99% of new cars sold in the US will still use internal combustion. So think about that for a second. In 25 years, most of the cars on the road in the US will still use internal combustion engine. Now, Prius and Tesla have become household names, and why wouldn't they? They're green, but remember, Prius uses what's known as a hybrid engine, which is a combination of an electric motor and an internal combustion engine. Now, Tesla and other electric vehicles, they are in fact fully electric. The cars themselves produce zero emissions and zero greenhouse gases. But here's the thing to think about. It's not just about the car. There are a lot of other issues that have to be considered or should be considered when we think about total emissions from a vehicle. Today, I'm just going to focus on one of those and that's the energy sources for electricity. Where does the electricity that powers your electric vehicle come from? In 2015, about two-thirds of electricity in the US came from fossil fuels. Well, guess what? In 1985, about two-thirds of electricity in the US also came from fossil fuels. Now, we've definitely made a positive transition from coal to natural gas in that time frame, and that's great, but the fact is, on a percentage basis, the amount of fossil fuels used to create electricity in the US has remained unchanged for the last 30 years. Another example is China. In China, about 75% of their electricity comes from fossil fuels. Specifically, coal is the majority. But then you have a country like Norway. In Norway, very little fossil fuels are used to create electricity. About 90% of their electricity comes from hydroelectric power, which is power derived from the potential energy of dammed water. So in Norway, for example, electric vehicles do in fact produce zero or near zero emissions because fossil fuels don't really come into the play. So it is possible, but the problem is that zero emissions vehicles, green cars that are truly green, only make up a very small portion of the cars on the road today. To go green, we must keep improving the internal combustion engine. So you're probably wondering, why am I so confident that we can do more with the internal combustion engine? Well, look at how far we've come. As an example, let's take carbon dioxide. 
Carbon dioxide is one of the major sources of greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, along with water vapor, is also a product of complete combustion. So the more fuel efficient your car is, the less fuel you need to get from point A to point B, and the less carbon dioxide you'll produce. Now, we've made significant strides in fuel efficiency since the onset of internal combustion. Cars today are about twice as fuel efficient as they were in 1975. In the last 10 years, we've improved our fuel economy by about 25%, and we will continue to improve it by another 50% in order to keep up with federal regulations. In addition, harmful emissions like nitro nitrogen oxides and particulate matter or soot are at historic lows. Now, how have we been able to do this? How, we, how have we been able to reduce emissions and improve fuel economy? We've done this by innovating. So in order to talk about how we innovate with internal combustion engines, let's first review how an internal combustion engine works. So in most modern engines, fuel is injected directly into the combustion chamber. It evaporates, mixes with air, it's ignited, forms a high temperature flame, which increases the pressure in the combustion chamber and does work on the piston. Now it sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, actually, it's not. So I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is that an internal combustion engine is actually one of the most complicated engineering problems out there. It relies on turbulent flow, fuel injection, fuel properties, fuel chemistry, an ignition system, and combustion chamber design. There are literally hundreds of parameters that can be tweaked in an engine to come up with an optimal configuration. But the greenest engine, which is our goal, is this optimum combination, and we need to find it. We need to find the recipe of design parameters that allow us to go as green as possible with internal combustion. Now, finding that, it's not easy. How could we possibly build and test engines out of all com combinations of parameters? We can't. So that's the bad news. But I'm not going to suggest we improve something, talk about how hard it is, and then not offer suggestions to improve it. The good news is, is there is an optimal recipe out there. There's a set of design parameters that does allow us to go as green as possible with internal combustion engines, and we have the tools to help us get there without having to build hundreds, thousands, or even millions of designs. We have really big computers. We have software that runs on these computers that allows us to test engine concepts before we build them. And we have optimization software that allows us to run a reduced set of designs in order to find an optimum. Now, these tools, along with experiments, have helped us meet emissions and fuel economy mandates throughout federal regulation history. Now, the engine keeps improving, partly because consumers want to fill up their tanks less often, but also because the federal regulations are forcing engine makers to find solutions in order to keep selling cars. Now, one approach that helps us improve combustion engines and has helped us is actually based on the theories of natural selection to find an optimum. In nature, how do organisms improve and adapt to their surroundings? They evolve. Nature can actually teach us how to save itself. A great example of this is the peppered moth. So before the Industrial Revolution, typically the peppered moth was light with dark spots. And this served as great camouflage against predators. Only about 2% of the population was dark. After the Industrial Revolution started, it was pollution that actually darkened surfaces on which moths rested, causing the lighter moths to be eaten and the darker ones to survive. The moth population evolved based on a change in its environment. So for internal combustion engines, concern for the planet and also federal regulations represent a change literally in its environment. Now, we can either allow engines to evolve to this environment more organically through trial and error, or we can directly use the principles of evolution to help us get there quicker. This is the premise of a genetic algorithm. A genetic algorithm is a procedure that runs on the computer that allows you to optimize a problem that has a lot of different parameters in it. So to see kind of how this works, let's go back to our moths. So you start with a population of designs, or in this case, a set of peppered moths, each with varied traits, in this case, number of spots. Now remember, after the Industrial Revolution, 
a moth's chance of survival was directly proportional to how dark it was. The li lighter moths would be eaten, and the darker ones would survive. So we start with this population of moths. We mix the traits to form a new generation. We select survivors to parent the following generation, and we keep doing this over a number of generations until the optimal design or the darkest moth is found. Now, we can do this with engines, and we have done it, but there's a lot more work to be done. The computer software that we can use to simulate these engines before building them is really good, but far from perfect under a lot of conditions, and it takes a long time to run. So for an example, think about an engine running at 2,000 RPM. One engine revolution takes about a tenth of a second, but to run that same engine revolution on the computer can take up to 24 hours. So computer methods and speeds both need to improve significantly to get us better answers quicker, but it's worth the effort. It's an important piece to allow us to go greener with internal combustion engines. Now, there tends to be an us versus them mentality when it comes to energy sources for transportation. Diehard environmentalists tend to preach the impending doom of the internal combustion engine in favor of a full electrification of vehicles a fleet of cars that gets zero emissions. Now, I would invite them to reevaluate their current thinking, not because I disagree, but because I think there's a middle ground that helps us get to a better solution. We shouldn't take our eyes off of short-term issues for long-term gains, especially when the short-term directly feeds into the long-term. We can do both, we can push both, even multiple strategies forward. Solar, wind, hydroelectric, nuclear, these are all viable energy options. They all need more research. They're all individual pieces of a bigger puzzle. So yeah, let's keep hugging trees, but why not also start hugging engines? <laughs> One of the most immediate ways we can go green is by improving the internal combustion engine. Thank you. <laughs>